Hello, everyone. I'm the director for our New Zealand registered not-for-profit Common Knowledge Trust. And I get inspired to do these videos <laughs> periodically. Then I do a run of them. So today I want to talk about the politics of childbirth and COVID. Um, so as I've said in many of the other videos, I've been involved in the childbirth conversation for 50 years. When I got involved in the conversation, it was in the U.S. when I gave birth in 1970. From the 60s until the mid-70s, the very first childbirth preparation or education classes were being taught. And those classes were Lamaze and Bradley. And in New Zealand, where I live, in the 50s to 70s, it was Grantley Dick Reed, three male obstetricians who had strong beliefs that not every birth should be dragged into the medical profession, and that low-risk women, if they learned their skills, breathing relaxation skills, that those women could then achieve natural birth. Nobody's ever defined the word natural. Does it mean good outcome and easy, or does it mean a woman can tear or bleed or a dead baby? But they wanted women to achieve a natural birth, pain-free labor, and what does pain-free actually mean? You don't feel anything or you don't get out of control and suffer. And without medical care. And that then ties back to the natural birth concept because the assumption is that low-risk women will have a low-risk, uncomplicated birth. And is that actually accurate? So if a healthy, low-risk woman is having twins or she ends up bleeding, <clears throat> or she tears through her rectum, fourth degree tear. Why do we see those things? Or, or if she was RH negative before the Rogam shots. These things are, you know, we're, it's sort of they're dismissed in the conversation, which that's what it was like in the 70s. So low risk women were perceived of as if they use these skills, could achieve natural birth, pain free labor without medical care. Now, those skills-based methods in the U.S. in the 1970s existed alongside a health department in the U.S. or maternity system in the U.S. where midwives had been outlawed since the 50s. Every state had its own rules about home births. Everybody was going to the hospital to have their baby, pretty much. But there was a very high societal expectation that we all attend the first childbirth preparation classes or education classes. This was a phenomena. It was absolutely new. And we all did it because we were all upwardly mobile and we saw ourselves as participating in the experience of birthing our baby and having more control over it than we had historically globally, where all we were faced with is the truth, which still exists, is there's no way to know what your birth's going to be like. And a tagged on phrase that says, and therefore there's really nothing you can do to prepare for it. But if you're interested in childbirth and you investigate every single traditional culture in the world, they all had a lot of pros and cons, do this, don't do that during pregnancy, because they're trying to safeguard the, this gateway experience, the birth between the, the mother and the baby. And they all have a lot of protocols around newborns because every culture knew prior to immunization and antibiotics that 25 to 30 percent of all children died before the age of five. So in some ways childbirth has always been political. I chose not to become involved in the politics. I worked with hundreds of families and we developed birthing better birth and birth coaching skills. In the early 70s through the 1980s, the skills evolved over a long period of time because we kept on addressing the gaps that people felt. So in 1970, 95% of us labored because cesareans were very high risk and very major abdominal surgery. And risks were considered to be normal, natural, and physiological. And everyone knew that there were a lot of risks and very few risks became problems. And most problems either just spontaneously resolved themselves or the medical profession had assessments, monitoring, and procedures 
to resolve some of the problems as well. And very, very few risks that became problems became tragedies. And that's true today. If you just took the medical profession away, then very few um, pregnancies end up as a tragedy. But enough do. And that's kind of like COVID, right? You know, two to five, maybe 15% fatality rate. If you took away the medical profession, who gallantly saved so many people, probably this, the fatality rate may have been anywhere between two and 15%, which isn't very big, except that it's very contagious, which means that more people die just because more people get it. And pregnancy is, is somewhat similar. If you're not pregnant, you, you're not going to die of a problem or have a problem. But once you're pregnant, you get into this group. And that group develops more risks than if you're not pregnant. And those risks increase at birth. Not because birth particularly is anything other than trying to get, you know, as mammals, we have live births, we don't lay eggs. And so at a live birth, you have the potential of something happening or something not being okay with this thing we're growing inside us. So the reason that I'm doing this today is because, the, particularly in the United States, in New Zealand, it, it, COVID hasn't become very political. New Zealand just shut down its borders. And now they're just doing what they're doing. India, it's become political. Brazil, it became political. Sweden became political. The United States has become political and very vocal. And why do we know that? Because of social media. When birthing better skills were developing in the 1970s, there was no social media. And there was no global conversation about childbirth. That didn't really exist until the 1980s when it became global. Global discussion about who are midwives in the equation. New Zealand put in place absolutely everything that home birth midwives and the natural birth movement wanted. And the midwives under NASCOM, New Zealand um, the Midwifery Association, had, has took over birth in 1990. The government gave them the ability to be the lead maternity carers, set up their own system, be direct entry trained, have a partnership with women, respect women's choices, and she'll be right. The 12.9% in 1990 was going to, the cesarean rate was going to go down. Well, it's gone up. It's almost 30%. So what happened? And this is the politics. So let me explain the politics to you the best I can. Um, vaccines. <laughs> right. Antibiotics, not so much, which is curious. Um, you know, an I grew up during the penicillin era when it first became available. So I was given penicillin for everything. Nobody thought that it was a miracle drug. Nobody thought that penicillin was going to cause antibiotic-resistant bacteria 80 years later. But it has. And so vaccines, I think smallpox was the first one. Vaccines, when I grew up, were an issue. We, my family was delighted to vaccinate us because prior to the Second World War, where there were no vaccines, 20 to 30 percent of children died. So people want to protect their children. We want to protect ourselves. So how did vaccines become an issue? Well, they started to become an issue because of the rise of autism and the belief that measles vaccines, that what was in the measles vaccine as a carrying agent or a preservative was causing autism. There's been a lot of studies saying that's not accurate. Even though we have global communication, measles vaccines around the world. 
I've never been able to find research one way or the other about the incidence of autism in countries that are vaccinating with measles. All the countries vaccinating with measles vaccines don't know. And in childbirth, I absolutely personally had no interest in the politics. Definitely dedicated my life to the skills that we developed back then and because families asked me to help get the concept out that they discovered, which is it's an activity. 100% of pregnant women have to do the activity of birthing our baby, and we do it by ourselves as women, no matter where, who's present, or the type of birth we have. And that because it's in activities, humans thrive on being skilled, and we should become skilled to do the activity. We happen to like birthing better skills, but if you want to learn other skills, go for it. We don't care. As a trust, we don't care. We support the broader concept. We also sell the Birthing Better online courses. But in the 70s, I just was not interested in the politics. I wasn't interested in politics in the 80s, <laughs> or even when I got to New Zealand in the 90s. Politics of childbirth is for other people to deal with, people who are talking about with what the medical profession should do as a delivery of service, or what midwives should do. So when midwives set up a partnership, that's politics, isn't it? When they respect women's choices, that's politics. When they don't believe that women need to be skilled because cows and cats aren't taught, and women just instinctively know how to birth and should trust their instincts, it turns out to be politics. When people believe that COVID is a nothing burger like the flu because the fatality rate is only 2 to maybe 15 percent. And so therefore, we shouldn't wear masks or keep social distancing. That becomes politics. And so how does childbirth and COVID get tied together? Well, when COVID happened, it affected everybody who was pregnant, didn't it? Okay, so that was politics. And in the 70s in the United States, when there was a very high societal expectation that we all attend a childbirth class, which happened to be skills-based, that wasn't really politics, which was very bizarre. Skills-based was about us doing the activity. And we were doing the activity within a medical system that was the evidence-based of the day. It had its assessments, monitoring procedures, and we had no choice. So because we lacked choice, we really didn't get dragged into the politics of childbirth. We just didn't have any choices. So instead, we used skills. And what the labor and delivery nurses and obstetricians saw over a generation of people was multiple millions of women coping better and fathers helping them. We lacked choices. So we used our skills in and around all the assessments, monitoring, and procedures. And then the politics happened because the natural birth movement began to talk about the, how important it was for women to have choices. And of course we should have choices. Should we have choices whether we vaccinate or not? Should we have choices about whether we get treatment if we think we have COVID? Or try to prevent our family or friends from getting COVID by keeping social distancing or wearing masks? This becomes really intense, doesn't it? And so what happens with this is that the common sense no longer prevails. And this is going to be the short and the sweet of what I wanted to talk to you about. We're going to go back to people who didn't want to get vaccinated or didn't want to go into the hospital to give birth. Those people who didn't want to go into the hospital to give birth, there's no legal requirement for you to be there, that's fine. The families I worked with, many of them were very religious. They didn't want to go into the hospital, wouldn't accept a blood product. They wouldn't even accept Rogam when it was developed for RH negative. It wouldn't have necessarily been my choice, it's their choice. But what I was honored to be part of was those families who developed skills in order to try to prevent 
any risks from becoming problems and to reduce or prevent the potential of any problems from becoming a tragedy. So that meant in the past 50 years, I've been honored and privileged to be involved in and now activating out publicly a concept that it's normal and natural when pregnancy to become skilled and pregnancy to become skilled and then use those skills to work through the activity of birthing your baby. Because when we are skilled, we do two things. We cope better because we handle things better and we manage things better. But we also recognize that getting this baby out of our body does have potential risks. Some of them are physiological. So if I'm Rh negative, that's physiological. If I have a breach, that's mechanical. Right? If I have an infection, that, that's physiological. But it's different than Rh negative. It's a temporary. Right? So, but those can get coupled together. If, if I don't cope with and I have a issue, and that be, then the coping or lack of coping can then acerbate the potential of a problem, because the birth can go on and on and on and on, and then that just tires the woman out, tires the baby out. Or if we're tight in our pelvis, and we have a breech baby, breech babies are normal and natural and physiological but they have a risk. Their head can get trapped in our body. We can't change the shape of the object. However, if we're skilled and for birthing better families, we created space in the pelvis, softened and figured out how to open up the bones. That made it safer for us to birth our breech babies or our twins because we made as much room as possible and reduced as much tension, which would reduce the potential of the baby's head getting stuck. So very early on in the 70s, when people were saying, I'm going to have a home birth, whether it's legal or not, the tact that Birthing Better took and what I eventually put into Common Knowledge Trust was that if that was true, as family said, we had to become skilled. If it was as simple as that. When the anti-vax movement started to say, we don't want to vaccinate our children, that's fine. That's fine if you don't want to vaccinate your children. However, if you lack skills to treat whooping cough, measles, meningitis, polio, then you're just taking a political stance. So if you're saying the medical profession in maternity care, they're imposing all these assessments, monitoring procedures, or interventions on us. None of them are necessary. So we're just going to have this natural birth, which means we're going to move away from the medical profession. We're going to let it spontaneously occur. We're not going to learn any skills to cope and manage well. We're not going to bother to learn any skills to prepare our body because women have always birthed. Then we have to be willing to deal with the consequences of that. And while the vast majority of women birth without incident, although many, many of them suffer, don't cope well, the fact is there's a good political argument to be made or political statement to be made that says we don't need any medical care around childbirth. Just let it happen. And if that's the politics, then we have to accept the percent of mothers and children that have issues from childbirth. If we're going to let a woman bleed, blip, maybe she'll die. If we're going to let a breech baby come through a tight baby body, maybe the head's going to get trapped and the baby will asphyxiate. That's it. Not going to vaccinate for measles. Most 
kids get over measles, a percent don't. COVID? Two to maybe 15% of people die? Is that acceptable within society? I don't know. But many more people will get it. And now they know that many more people with COVID have long-haul symptoms. So even when we look at childbirth, death isn't the only issue. How about women who have pain on sex? Or every time they cough or laugh or walk, they pee. How about babies that have suffered some sort of problem coming out and have cerebral palsy? So it, it isn't a question of death or nothing, everything's fine. It's a question of death being at one extreme, healthy being at another extreme, and lots of stuff in between there. So there are people who are still ranting about how the medical profession is screwing women in childbirth. So this is what we learned years and years and years ago. If you do not want assessments and monitoring procedures that the medical profession considers going to safeguard you and your baby, don't go to the doctor. Don't go to the hospital. That's your choice. If you lack skills to deal with the repercussions of your choice, that's where our trust within birth is saying that we don't think that's the, we don't, you know, consider, please reconsider, right? Can we consider and become skilled? Become skilled because if you're going to be without any medical care, you don't want the woman to suffer. You don't want the birth to go on for hours. You don't want something to happen. You want to reduce any potential risks from becoming problems, problems becoming serious, and problems becoming tragedies. Doesn't that make sense? And with COVID, it's the same. If you actually just don't believe this is anything, then at least have some skills if you start to feel unwell. And have skills. If somebody in your family gets really unwell, do you have the skills to treat pneumonia? Do you have the skills to treat rapid heartbeats or irregular heartbeats? Do you have the skills to treat the potential for strokes that are happening in post-COVID situations? Do you have the skills to treat the chronic fatigue so many COVID long-haul people feel? Do you have the skills? And if you don't, then you are actually just working on a belief that it's perfectly normal and natural and physiological for women and children in pregnancy and childbirth to be damaged or dead. And that it's perfectly normal and natural when we have a virus ripping around the world that is highly infectious, that it's okay to just let it rip around the world and lose 2 to 15% of the people. So the politics of childbirth and COVID just now, they just come together. More people are getting COVID than people are giving birth. It's a bigger range of people, men and women. Pregnancy is exclusive to a group of people, but it's never going to stop. There's always going to be a group of people pregnant. There's always going to be a group of people who have to give birth one way or another. It's always going to be a group of people who the woman alone is doing this activity with her child. It is our individual birth. We can have an attitude about, oh, I just think it's natural, or I just want every type of medical care. That's fine. We still have to do this activity. And our trust advocates, because of the families that develop birthing better, a concept, which is simple to repeat, when you're pregnant, it's normal and natural, self-learn some skills and use them. Primarily, you're using skills 
so that you work through the activity feeling more in control, coping better. Secondarily, you're using the skills, particularly when you prepare your body, to reduce or prevent the potential of your baby getting stuck in your body and having a long birth and your baby doing damage to your body for the rest of your life or your body doing damage to your baby for the rest of its life. COVID? Gee whiz! It's harder to develop skills around COVID. What was discovered ver very early on was if you let people get really, really sick, a lot of them are going to die. That's where people were saying, well, people with pre-existing conditions and older people are the ones that are dying. Yes, yeah, statistically that's true, but it's when people get that sick is when they're more likely to die. So it became very apparent right away that you want to treat people early on. But there really wasn't any way of, of treating them. People didn't really focus on that. They just said, go home and kind of do nothing. And so in, in the bizarrest of bizarre things, our trust also produced these things. So <laughs> there you go. This is what to do if you feel you are getting sick with COVID. We have the skills about childbirth. But I got involved in childbirth and COVID when COVID came out. But I recognized that everybody was being told, go home if you feel sick and don't do anything. And we went, no, no, no. We have to treat this in the same way we treat the activity of giving birth. Do something for yourself. Learn some skills. Don't just say no. Just learn some skills. And these were simple skills that anybody could do around the world because our trust is called common knowledge. And so we have childbirth skills that are based on a human body. We all blink, we all cough, you can all tighten up your rectum. You all have bones you sit on and you can put them as far apart as possible. That makes it easier for this to come out. It's simple things. You know, if you feel sick with COVID, immediately start to wash out the back of your nose and your throat and do that consistently through the day for days after days. You're not gonna eliminate it or cure it any more than you're going to stop giving birth, stop birth from happening once you're pregnant. However, you can reduce the viral load. And in childbirth, by learning skills, you can cope better. So this is my rant for today. I am still dealing with people in childbirth that are pissed off with the medical profession. Don't go. Okay, honestly, if you don't want to get vaccinated, do not go. Do not go and, and to the hospital if you, if you don't want to be at the hospital for birth. For goodness sakes, learn some skills to take care of yourself. Doesn't that make common sense? And that hasn't been the conversation. The conversation is do nothing. It's a conversation around childbirth. Don't go to the medical profession, just trust it. And that's what for 50 years I've been saying to people, that's insanity. It's insanity. COVID. Oh, it's just a nothing burger. Don't do anything. It's insanity. It, it's insanity. I mean, humans thrive on being skilled. We love being able to drive a car cook a good, good meal, be a good lover, raise our kids sensibly, do our work with skills. We even go to a pharmacy or use herbs or homeopathics or acupuncture, traditional health. Whether we have, if we have diarrhea or we're vomiting, we, we use skills. Right? <laughs> Childbirth and COVID, yeah, not so much, right? So, that's really all I want to say to you today, is if you just want to do it, just please become skilled. Because you're doing it. It's called doing. <laughs> it's an activity. you got to do it. 
So just become skilled to do the activity of being sick with COVID, being sick with anything, or birthing your baby. Just become skilled. You'll birth better. And I certainly, when I got COVID in March of 2020, really did these things. I don't have pre-existing conditions, but I'm older. But it was in March of 2020. There wasn't a lot of information about it. So I did these things along with other things. And it took me 21 days to get past the acute phase of COVID and months and months of long haul symptoms. And so I did a playlist, COVID long haul playlist. I'll put it into the description of this as well because people are lacking skills and they're freaked. They're not coping well. And they're, when they don't cope well and they s stimulate the sympathetic nervous system and that shuts down everything, fright, flight, fight, freeze. So skills around COVID have a lot to do with activating your parasympathetic nervous system, which opens up your blood vessels, makes you feel calmer, develops nitric oxide and distributes it in your body, gives you a higher carbon dioxide tolerance, which separates the oxygen from your red blood cells and sends it out into your organs and your tissues and heals the endothelial cells that may be damaged. So I'm finished for today. All right. See you later. If you like what I'm saying, please subscribe to our channel, pass this on to other people. And for goodness sakes, just understand that we are humans. We thrive on being skilled. Become skilled in the things that you value for yourself and those you love. Bye-bye.